Okay, so here's an idea. One of the consequences of philosophical nominalism oh, yeah. is that when it comes to explaining the perceptions granted us by the various sense organs, a basically Darwinian response is, well, they just evolved because they happen to help us survive better in the physical environment that we inhabit. Which means that, like, vision is just, um, you know, we wouldn't expect different organisms, different lineages to evolve the same kind of eye if you just take the standard Darwinian explanation that random gene mutations lead to certain traits at the phenotypic level. Uh And that the eye just sort of, after a series of fortunate mutations that were selected for, the eye just appeared um, to see a certain layer of the visual spectrum. But if you take a, what, Platonist, or let's say a Gertian view, Uh the eyes evolved to see light, and there's something sun-like because all light comes from the sun, I mean, the dominant source of light, at least, is the sun. The eyes must be in some way sun-like in order to perceive the light radiated by the sun. Mm-hmm. And so the eye, the eye isn't merely um, a contingent sort of arbitrary organ of perception. It perceives objectively. Mm-hmm. And indeed... Simon Conway Morris, a biologist, pointed out what's called conversion evolution, that the water-based eye that, like, what we have evolved, like, 40 separate times. So there's clearly more than just accident, accidental mutation and selection going on. Mm-hmm. The, the visual spectrum... If you were just working with probabilities, it would be very improbable. Yeah. If, if you're not assuming any kind of, like, meaningful, fo- like, form or structure... Yeah, I mean, it, life. granted, other species have eyes that can see, you know, like bees can see in the ultraviolet spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But they're kind of like different extremes or variations on the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, insect yeah. eyes are different, but they're still perceiving light from the sun, and so there's something sun-like about them. And so from a Gertian point of view, there's a light has an archetypal power, and the eye is a is an expression of that power. It's not just a contingently assembled, like part by part, <laughs> by a by a arbitrary selective process. Mm-hmm. It's just statistical. Um, the eye emerged because it incorporated the idea of the sun Mm -hmm. it incarnated the logos and uh all each of the senses incarnates a different aspect of the logos that i suppose but we could talk we could talk about the ears or uh other organs but the eyes and the ears in particular are like the most um Mm -hmm. what intense for the human yeah they're very prominent So, in relation to nominalism, you brought well, that up. Because there's no form in nature. Well, I feel like if nominalism were the case, you know, it, we're living in a very improbable <laughs> outcome of the nominalistic universe. Right. Which is also a nihilistic one, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like the flip side of... Or it's just implicit mm-hmm. in nominalism. It's more of like an existentialist, if there's any meaning. It's kind of like all like subjective, individual. Right. Um, which, you know, if you think about the existentialists, I'm not saying that's exactly what they thought, but anyway. Um, oh, but if, it, if nominalism were the case, I don't think we would have this... <laughs> world yeah you know i think it's more it's kind of like when you ask about the percepts without the thinking that's woven into the percepts that 
you know, that al- that allows us to even comprehend what we're experiencing. Mm-hmm. It would just be an aggregate of unrelated. It would just be chaos. Yeah. That's what that's what like just it, you know, raw experience without thinking, which is not what people experience in perception. Right. Um, Otherwise, you know, there would be no communicative. I just don't think it would be able to communicate. We would be able to communicate. Here's what what's interesting, and it's a tension I've felt sometimes in like the more idealist um, emphasis of 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 Steiner is whether it's meaningful to talk about perception somehow isolated, pure perception isolated from concepts Uh and to describe that as just chaotic Um, you know, Kant does that even as much as Hume Mm -hmm. Um, and Whitehead has a different way of looking at it where, but it might not necessarily be in conflict with what Steiner is saying, but Whitehead says there really never was a chaos of pure perception. The perceptual field, it's, it comes to us already ordered. Yeah. And furthermore, what we think of as concepts are, there's a, there's a in, in other words, a mental pull, even in electrons mm-hmm. and in plants and in, and in all yeah. the uh, energy vectors that characterize the physical world or the inorganic world, if we want to call it that. Yeah. Or they have a mental pull. And so concepts don't just become operative in the human. Mm -hmm. They've always already sort of permeated at the causal level the natural world, and that's why nature has an order. Mm -hmm. Because there is a mental activity at work in the growth of plants and uh, in the radiation of light and the Mm -hmm. propagation of gravity, like... There's some mathematical harmony being expressed. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so the world comes to us experientially already ordered, right? And then, yeah, we reflect further upon it. But I think the idea of chaos, like, there is no pure chaos. Well, that's, I mean, that's what Steiner and Barfield both say, that we don't experience that. Right. It's, that's like, it's a fiction that people talk about it, but there's a lot of assumptions, you know, I guess, you know, if we're talking about nominalism and perception, um, or, you know, just, uh, skepticism, um, mm-hmm. yeah, whenever you were describing that, it was reminding me of, in the philosophy of freedom, just when he's describing the thinking as something that is happening in us uh-huh. as well as the outside world. Right. And like you were describing Whitehead's polar. You know, right. like everything is in thought. So thinking isn't making up thought ideas. thought isn't everything. Thinking is perceiving ideas. So yeah. Like well, ideas and are real and thought perceives them rather than thinking of ideas as something you just make up, like subjectively. Yeah. Yeah, they're more like, you know, I guess in, if you go back to the, that, the word eidos, right? Is that how you pronounce it? I think so. It's more like images, right? It's, it's like, it's not... It's the look of a thing. It's not as reduced as what I feel like people associate with the word idea. Or I should say abstract. I feel like when people think yeah. of ideas today, they think of very abstract. It's very vague, you know, whereas images are like, you know, if you think about Goethe, it's like... It's like this, you know, hyper real mm-hmm. um, living aspect of like the tree that we see before us. Like it's in our imaginative capacity to perceive its whole history um, mm. as a being and its future. And just to see the morphology between the different parts and that meaningful relationship. Right, right. Yeah, it's, I'm going to be sore. Like, right. it's going to be. And so that, that is a kind of thinking, that whole plant development. Right. So the way that scientific materialism and like reductionistic, mechanistic approaches to natural science try to do this is like, they come up with an idea first, they, they create a model 
and then they try to de develop some kind of instrument that tests the model, some technological intervention or measurement of nature that tests the model. And then if the instrument shows what they expect, <laughs> they declare that the model has been proven or verified. <laughs> it's uh, there! <laughs> the ghost is there. Sometimes the ex you know experiment doesn't detect what they're looking for, but there's something funny going on with the... I mean, this might upset people... But the way, like, you know, particle collide, like the Large Hadron Collider, it didn't find what they were initially expecting, so they kind of just changed the way they looked, they were looking for, like the Higgs boson. Uh-huh. Because, you know, there's a lot at stake, right? If they don't find what they expected well, to find, the funders are like, oh, we're going to pull the plug. This is kind of expensive. I and, mean, like, you guys yeah. are... The, the light's not going off, and, like... <laughs> But, I bet that's really disappointing, but continue. Yeah. Well, but, you know, they did find it, and the Nobel well, Prizes it's were not, awarded. I would but, say it's never pointless. I mean... Yeah, we learned something, but it's like... Even if, even if like, the whole machine ends up being, you know, pointless <laughs> in the future. And interestingly, like, no new technology has come out of these machines yet. I but, remember when it was first being kind of reported on, and, and it like, just seemed like this numinous thing. You'd be like, oh, what's going to come out of that? Yeah, I mean, fascinating science, but... Um, Hello. Hi. Not like the major explanatory or technologically advancing discovery that we were hoping for. You know, if we know how all mass is created, you'd think we would be able to apply that technologically and do some pretty cool shit. But I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when, like, the electron and electromagnetism was discovered, it was like... Oh, holy shit, we can send radio signals and bounce it off the ionosphere, and, like, <clears throat> that was discovered pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So the electrons are more, I think, um, understood to some degree, because we can manipulate them so effectively. But the Higgs, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to get too far into that, because I might not know what I'm talking about, but... It's just an, ex an expression of nominalism in physics is that math becomes detached from uh -huh. physics and there's more tinkering with mathematical models and trying to, you know, develop a few experiments to correlate the models, correlate with the models. But the f models all have, like, infinitely many free parameters, which means you can sort of add in things just arbitrarily, like dark matter. It's like, oh, the equation's not predicting the motion of stars at the edge of galaxies. Let's just invent a bunch of matter. We didn't detect it anywhere, but we can plug it into the equation and make it work. So even math has become nominalistic. I mean, mathematical physics, mm -hmm. which you would think would be the most Platonist of all the sciences. The, it's like the bad kind of Platonism, though, like the abstract. Yeah, it's it's not like a a math that's very, I guess, drawn out of our experience. Yeah, I was like really struck by. I was listening to this lecture series, um, cycle of Steiner's, where he was describing the relationship of mathematics to the body, and that. We wouldn't have, like, there wouldn't have been this historical discovery of certain mathematical truths without a physical body. Like, it's based upon being a physical, spatial being. Yeah. Time being as well. Mm -hmm. More and more. Right. And I was like, wow, that's like, and that's, I guess, how, that's like a way to teach math is to, like, unfold it out of ourselves. Yep. That's what geometry used to be. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Geometry. I love geometry. Um, it felt intuitive to me, and Euclidean geometry. And yeah, you kind of have like an inward relationship with the shapes. But when I I took physics, I would always sometimes I'd get that intuitive hit, but I'd always get the problems wrong. Like, so something wasn't clicking for me in the mathematical aspect of it. Chemistry also was intuitive to me. But there's something about the abstraction required for a mechanistic explanation of a natural process to 
be predictive. Yeah. That just yeah. never quite sat right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see its, it's that's, value. But... Well, that's, that's like where it gets complicated, right? Because if you presume that that is how the world works, then you're going to fall into abstraction. You won't, like, you won't basically be in time. You yeah. know, like living free time process. Right. Where there's potential for novelty. Because then you read someone like Aristotle. Yeah. And, you know, the first time I would hear about Aristotle in, like, a modern-day science textbook or something, they'd make fun of his ideas yeah. and, and sort of describe it as if he was saying, well, the future in, for Aristotle could cause the past. And <laughs> it's like, no, no, that's not what final causality <laughs> means exactly. <laughs> I don't you, think I even... I don't even remember learning about that when I was really young. That's how, like, teleology is caricatured yeah. by materialism. But when you actually read Aristotle... And, and understand his project, like what he thought natural philosophy was supposed to be. He's describing the world as concretely as possible. And like his physics is like, when you consider it from like post-Galilean <laughs> perspective, pretty, I mean, he didn't even bother to drop, you know, cannonballs of different sizes and weights. Just to, you know, He just made the claim that heavier bodies would fall faster wrong very simple experiments can you know disprove that but on the, on the other hand like phenomenologically his account of the relationships among the elements is very intuitive and describes the order of the cosmos in a kind of um systematic way mm -hmm. even if it's mathematically naive it is uh, qualitatively yeah. rich and, and in some ways I think still correct. Like the, geo, the whole geocentric imagination of the cosmos well, now is that we know, simply like, wrong. We're in a huge, vast universe and the solar system is, you know, one of many. Then it relativizes like the... I mean, it doesn't relativize. It like qualifies like the heliocentrism. You know, with, uh, well, that you can look at it from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but the, the heliocentrism is still important, as is the geocentrism. Well, just in the way that quantum and relativity theories both bring the observer back into the equation, so to speak, um, you, that they just show how you can't remove the uh -huh. measurement event or the observer from the experimental situation. And so the mathematics are always going to be predicting a measurement, right? So in, in other words, the measurer, the observer becomes a feature of the, yeah. the model. And that, there was some hint of that already in, you know, just Copernicus's realization, but there was still this sort of God's eye view that was assumed and so once physics begins to incorporate the act of measurement, uh, it becomes impossible to describe nature as a machine anymore because you're not a mechanic outside of mm -hmm. the total situation. Well, you know, predict, yes, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're inside of it. So mm -hmm. yeah. depending on the sorts of experiments and instruments you design, nature's going to behave in a certain way in response to you. So yeah. you can't eliminate... The subjective from the objective situation, because the total situation is neither subjective nor objective, but... That's why we need to focus on the human being and try to find what is universal, or at least yeah. archetypal about being human. And once we know our instrument, hmm. you know, then we can start to better sense into the meaningfulness of the world and the unfolding of time, hmm. I think. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think we know enough about the human, like, it, it's all embedded oh. in childhood education, like, teach them math and music, and teach them history, and, and celebrate their creativity. <laughs> yeah, well, in education, but also, I mean, I'm really excited uh, to, I mean, there's so many, so many complexities about living in this moment, but one of the exciting things is, like, you know, there's been the critique of fragmentation for so long, 
But there's also been this insane specialization and, and like this kind of development of so much, like, I guess, knowledge into specific fields. And if you're someone who can bring all of that together and work with others in different fields and interpret that in a more, interpret the data and try to, like, uh, I guess, integrate them into a holistic picture. There's never been such an opportunity for that because of all of the intense fragmentation um, and what's been produced from it, which is not all good, but, um, and now we all have access to everyone. Mm-hmm. And there's so much collaborative energy right now. Yeah. I feel like that's another aspect of like trying to understand the human being um, in this moment mm-hmm. in relation to uh, what you were describing about the physics. Yeah. So. None of this is to say that I'm not super interested in like what the new web space telescope might uncover by applying its various measuring instruments to like mm-hmm. resolve the most distant in time and space regions or epochs of the universe that we've ever been able to measure before. I mean, that's going to hopefully throw everything we think we know already into relief in a new and interesting way. Yes, I hope so. Because I think there's a lot of chinks in the armor of the Big Bang or inflationary model of cosmology. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like we're on the verge of a kind of global paradigm shift, not just a paradigm shift in some special science, but our whole cosmological framework is about to be kind of turned upside down and inside out because we've just been looking at space, time, matter, and energy and, and as if it were separate from consciousness, even though our own physics, like quantum and relativity theory, like I was saying, have shown us that consciousness cannot be separate from the universe. Mm-hmm. It must have always been part of it. If you really follow that through, you end up with something like what Barfield and Steiner are talking about. Yeah. It's not to say the science is wrong, it's to say it needs to be recontextualized. Yes, recontextualized, yeah. And I mean, doing that. You know, like consistently non bifurcated way, which is not easy because it's not the way most people experience the world. Well, because of our education. Yeah. We're trained to be numb to the formative meaning of our sense experience and our embodied life. Well, you know, there's other ways of thinking about it, interestingly. You know, that's also a feature, you know? Yeah. That's, like, like a more apparent feature of our condition. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like, this is just one example, but I think there Steiner are other things. Rosa theorists. and Resonance, or...? Or, um, no, actually, I was going to mention something that Steiner said again. Okay. But <laughs> he's describing that this time, uh, for many people, um, there is, like, a, the densest relationship... Um, between the physical body and the the higher the bodies of higher, I guess super sensible perception, mm-hmm. and contact with the spiritual ecology, um, and so it's also like something that's part of our constitution in his way of thinking mm-hmm. in this time, uh, which is and actually and the agency for that's kind of lifted out slightly, even though we have freedom and we're participating in this um but it's more of a like he describes it as a phase in the morphology of consciousness that almost like a certain aspect of a plant's development um so it's almost like archetypally being ingressed by higher beings who (laughs) Mm. evolve consciousness or a part of the evolution of consciousness so it's such a different way of thinking about it um because i think people tend to think more in a kind of externally like it's these institutions' fault that we have this kind of consciousness, but they're growing out of us. So you here, know, our forebears, at least. The big ask, in the sense of like where contemporary people are basically at, that anthroposophy makes is to say, look, you're never going to understand the universe if you just use your senses and your abstract thoughts. You're going to, if you want to understand the universe, you have to first of all see beyond the veil of death. 
your your own death. Yeah. And yeah. and and recognize that your consciousness continues beyond that point. And you also have to see before your own birth in a way. It's the same sort of initiatory process. Yeah. To see that, you know, your yeah, unbornness. Your spirit and soul are um not bound by the physical body that you know and think that you are. You are your physical body, but you're not just your physical body. But most people just think that that's all they are. And so unless what Steiner is trying to say is unless you pass through the portal of death and perceive the universe and the, the music of the spheres as sheaths, which are in a sense part of your own body, and that you only like reach them and experience them if you can see beyond the veil of your own death. And then, you know, he describes like moving out from the moon, the inner planets, just all the way out to Saturn. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that is like, there's, well, then there's galactic existence. And, but you have to move through the proper gates to know the whole. You can't just look out with your physical eyes and measure the stars. I mean, Plato already knew this. Hello. This is why Plato was like, yeah, astronomy is great, but geometry is mm -hmm. where it's really at if you want to commune it's with like the an one. It's like an inward relation to... It's also outer, but... Uh... Mm. But you know what I mean? We can't, like... Modern yeah. science is based on the senses and abstract thought modeling. And just, it's very spatial. And just says know? death is the end. Yeah, and it's the, like the the... It doesn't... It assumes the rea the ultimate reality of a spatial kind of world, you know. Yep. Um, Res so extensa. It's like, yeah. So it's like it's um, counterintuitive to imagine like this virtual world, like in the, any kind of correspondence with the stars. I think, but but I think also that's like deeply in people as well, in the yeah. wonder that people feel that we feel when we look at the, the stars. Oh yeah, it's totally the feeling of wonder. And that's the soul responding to the cosmos, the psyche responding to the cosmos. It's a feeling of wonder. Yeah. It's like an emotional attunement. It doesn't necessarily have understanding yet, but it's definitely emotionally attuned. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh the mythologies of the past that talk about our that were like from the sun, the stars and are the stars our ancestors? Yep. Well, that's like a there's a lot of truth in that regard yeah I mean the sacrifice and then Brian and Swim you know talking about even our elemental composition is tied to the explosion of stars. yeah exactly and you know our sun is like a second or third generation star and so there were there could have been a couple of tremendous sacrifices of there astral could. beings prior to the birth of this solar system that were required for us to be here like yeah. the death of a couple of stars was like essential in terms of the morphogenesis of cellular and multicellular animal life yeah and i think also you know one of the things that that barfield you know criticizes with the way that uh we have a tendency you know, to think about the larger cosmos, its history, mm -hmm. in the ter in the measurements that we use in our sense perceptible experience, yeah, and that it may not actually correspond with the reality of what has transpired. Yeah. So it's like maybe there is something really fundamental about this sun, this particular sun, you know, and it's not just easily related to other stars. Well, it brings us full circle. It's just that, like, our mode of vision, the shape of our eyes, the form, you know, the, of our visual experience is in some way intimately correlated with the nature of the sun. And so... We can't even begin to try to perceive the rest of the universe until we understand that it's going to be heliocentric in some sense. Like, this, as if the sun was the lens through which we were perceiving the rest of the universe. And so in a similar way, like you were saying, until we understand the human, our own instrument, we're not going to understand nature. Until we understand, like, the sun being, we're not going to understand the rest of the galaxy. Because we see the rest of the galaxy through the sun. 
Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it's, it's, it's sort of like, the, it's the sun, but it's also like, oh, oh, oh you okay? You okay, you need a hand? Yeah. Hold this slick out here. Is your back okay? Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Careful out there. Hope she's okay. 